audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. When you gather with friends, whether in the hallway at work or around a barbie on the weekend, the subject of hell is probably not the first or last topic of discussion. You're possibly more likely to talk about sports, holiday destinations, the latest news about old friends or something else, but not hell. But the reality is, the Bible talks a lot about hell, what it's like, where it is, and who's going there. Thanks for listening to Leading the Way with pastor and author, Dr. Michael Youssef. On this episode, Dr. Youssef wraps up his series, Heaven Awaits. He'll dive into the various verses in the Bible where the reality of hell is tackled and what Jesus said about it. Listen with me now as Dr. Yusuf begins today's Leading the Way. The subject of hell is not a very popular subject in many pulpits today. As a matter of fact, not long ago I read well over 50% of pastors said that they would never preach on hell throughout their ministry. Again, let me be upfront with you. For me personally now, I would rather preach ten sermons on heaven than one sermon on hell. That is my heart. That is the absolute truth. Emotionally, humanly, and in every other way, I would rather avoid the subject too, like they do. Now, I'm telling you this because not only I want to be truthful with you, but also to let you know that I know the temptation that I understand the temptation. I really genuinely do understand the temptation of avoiding the biblical teaching on hell. But also believe when I tell you that it would be absolutely a dereliction of my calling, God's calling my life, a dereliction of my call to be a steward of the Word of God, that I would leave out this extremely extremely important teaching. So you may ask, well, Michael, why do you want to preach on hell to the congregation that is basically primarily saved eternally and going to heaven? I want to tell you why. Four reasons. Number one, to be faithful steward of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that requires it. Secondly, because it is God's Word. And thirdly, Jesus talked more about hell than He did about heaven. Fourthly, because when believers understand the anatomy of hell, it will revolutionize their zeal for the lost. It will energize their prayer life for the lost. It will ignite their zeal for reaching the lost. Beloved, listen to me. We are watching history being made right now. We are the generation that's seeing some historic things that we have not seen ever before. Hatred toward Bible-believing Christians is on the rise all over the world. And this demonic rage against faithful believers and children of the living God is on the rise for many reasons. Above all, is because Satan knows his time is getting short. He knows, and he and his demons sense, that the time of them being thrown into the lake of fire is getting very close. And don't ever forget, the Bible makes it clear that hell was created, was made by God for Satan and his demons. That is the intention. Revelation 20 and 10 There in the lake of fire, Satan and his followers will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Please think about this phrase, forever and ever. And that's precisely why in these end times, the great deceiver is tempting so many people to turn their backs on biblical truth, on biblical teaching, on biblical lifestyles, because He wants as many of them to follow Him into that lake of fire. But here's the good news. Are you ready for some good news? Here's the good news. While Satan and his demons have no choice, while Satan and his demons cannot be forgiven by God, 
while Satan and his demons cannot be redeemed, while Satan and his demons cannot escape hell, you and I and every human being around the world have that choice. We can choose our eternal destiny. We can choose to escape from hell. We can choose to come to Christ in repentance and in faith and in confession. We can choose to receive the gift of eternal life, the gift of forgiveness from His hands. We can choose for Christ to live in us, to lead us, to guide us all the way home. Amen. Question. Who is our source of knowledge about hell? Well, how do we know about hell? How do we know? Who is the source of that information? Jesus Himself. All the knowledge we have, if not 90% of it, we have it from Jesus. Almost everything we know about hell came from the lips of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who came from heaven, died on a cross, and rose again so that people might come to believe in Him and escape hell. As I said, Jesus spoke more about hell than heaven. But also Jesus spoke about hell in the most urgent, the most vivid, and the most descriptive way. Jesus spoke about hell in the most caring heartbroken and compassionate way. Why? Because he knows what it is like in that place. He was there when hell was created. He created it for Satan and his demons for rebelling against the holy God. And that is why he constantly pleaded with people to repent of their sin and to accept God's plan of salvation. In Matthew 23 and in Luke 19, Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. Why? Because its inhabitants have rejected Him as the prophesied Messiah, the awaited Messiah. They've rejected Him, and that is why He wept. Now, I want to spend the remaining moments I've got to talk about what Jesus told us about hell. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus tells us clearly that hell is a real place, and it is prepared for Satan and his angels. In Matthew 18, 21, all the way to 35, he tells us that it is a place of confinement. He describes it as a prison, but a prison that would imprison the soul and the spirit. You see, physical prisons that imprison the body cannot imprison the mind the soul, or the spirit. Paul and Silas were bleeding from every pore of their body when they were thrown in the prison in Philippi, and yet that prison could not confine the spirit sword in praise and in worship and in singing, so much so that an earthquake came and hit the place. But imprisonment of hell is an imprisonment of the soul. It's truly confined and that confinement is unimaginable. In verse 34, Matthew 18, Jesus described it as a place of torture. In Matthew 22, 13, Jesus tells us that hell is a place of utter darkness. In Matthew 25, 30, Jesus described hell as a place not only of utter darkness, but it is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the darkness of hell, there is no day and night. There is no beautiful sunrise and sunset. Utter darkness, but not only physical darkness. It's a place of moral and spiritual darkness, a place of a complete absence of goodness and the presence of God. Those who are confined to hell will experience constant agony and relentless regret even before His death and resurrection. Our Lord Jesus Christ tells us about an incident that has taken place, not a parable, an incident has taken place, but only Jesus could have known about 
It's in Luke chapter 16. It's a true story that only Jesus would have known. And it's a story about two men. One was a self-centered man, was a self-worshipping man, was a self-focused man. And then there's another poor man by the name of Lazarus who lived at the doorstep of that self-worshipping man. When they both died, each went to a different side of Hades or Sheol. And between them is a huge chasm, a huge chasm. The self-worshipping man went to that place of torment and agony, awaiting the real judgment, the real pain, and the real agony. Lazarus, on the other hand, the man who exercised the faith of Abraham in awaiting for the Messiah to come and looking forward to the day of the coming of the Messiah, that during his lifetime, while he suffered a great deal, but he continued in the faith of Abraham. What is that faith of Abraham? It was expecting the Messiah to come. In fact, Jesus said to the Jewish group that was listening to him, he said, not only before Abraham was, I am. He said, Abraham longed for this day that you are experiencing it right now. That is the faith of Abraham. This is how all of the Old Testament believers are saved. That is how the Old Testament saints have gone to glory because they took upon them the faith of Abraham, of awaiting a deliverer, the Messiah, God's own Messiah. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.19 that after being made alive, Jesus went and made a proclamation to the prison spirits, those who were waiting for Jesus to come as the Messiah. He declared His Lordship and he vindicated their waiting, vindicated their looking forward to his coming. And he set them free, and he took them all the way to paradise, and he opened the third heaven for them. The resurrected Jesus went to that very place in Sheol and took his believers to paradise. And as Jesus draws this incredible picture of that incident and the contrast between the fate of the godless man and that of Lazarus. He tells us that godly Lazarus, who, like Abraham, looked forward to the coming of the Messiah by faith, ended up on one side of Hades. And the godless man who lived for self, did not live by faith, ended up on the other side of that same place. And Jesus said, even before his death and resurrection, that there was a gulf and a chasm between those two sections of Hades. And yet somehow, somehow, the godless man was able to communicate with those who are in the other side, where across the chasm that has separated them, but somehow they were able to communicate with each other at that point before the resurrection of Jesus. So the godless, who constantly in pain and agony said to Abraham, Father Abraham, he calls him Father Abraham because he thought because he being Jew that he has got an in with Abraham. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. As I said, the man thought that Abraham would be on his side, for he was ethnically Jew. Now, beloved, make no mistake about it. I want to make it very clear. Only those who are spiritual descendants of Abraham are saved. Those who live by faith in Jesus Christ, whether before His coming as they looked forward to it, or after His coming as we look back to it, are saved. Listen to me. Ethnicity means nothing, but faith in Jesus means everything. Beloved, whenever I read those words of this godless man pleading with Abraham, I'm in agony. I'm in agony in this fire. It tears me up. It tears me up. 
It tears me up for the people I witnessed to, pleaded with, and died without Christ. But please, do not miss the irony of the moment here. Do not miss this. The irony regarding this incident that had taken place that Jesus tells us about. This godless man did not lift a finger to minister to Lazarus or anybody else for that matter. Now he wants Lazarus, big Abraham, for Lazarus to dip his finger in the water to cool his burning tongue. Abraham's response was this, we have a great chasm between us. We cannot go to your side, and you cannot come to our side. That is why everywhere when I'm preaching, I remind people that the day is coming when the door will be shut, but it is wide open now. We cannot cross over to you. You can't cross over to us. So what happened? This man, who lived all his life for self, never placed his trust in God, never believed the promises of the Old Testament. What happened? Only a few minutes in hell, and he became an evangelist. <laughs> he really became an evangelist. So he begs Father Abraham, send Lazarus to rise from the dead and go to my family to warn them so they do not end up in this place of torment. Abraham's answer and effect is this. They have the Bible. They have the Bible. And if they don't believe the Bible, even if somebody rises from the dead, they will not believe. It is reported that Frederick Nietzsche, words are attributed to him, that he said he's glad he's going to hell because in hell, there are very interesting people there that he likes to hobnob with. He said they're certainly much more interesting than those who are going to heaven. The list of the people that the Bible tells us about who are going to hell in Revelation 21, 8. Very interesting people indeed, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and just the list goes on and on. But that's not the issue. There is something else very, 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 very important in response to Nietzsche's fallacy and falsehood about the inhabitants of hell. There will be no fellowship in hell. There is no communion in hell. There is no opportunity to hobnob with anybody in hell. They will not be seeing each other. They will be separated from each other. It is a place of solitary confinement, our Lord said. Everybody is totally and completely and utterly alone, isolated. All feeling of attachment, friendship, and love are forgotten in hell. Beloved, think about this with me. Please think with me. When the eternal stakes are this high, when the eternal stakes are this high, why would anyone risk his or her eternal future? Why? Why would we allow friends and loved ones not be forewarned? Why would we not care about friends and neighbors to go to such horrendous place? And it's not just for a year or two, a decade or two. It's forever and ever and ever. I'm going to level with you again. <laughs> It is exhausting, spiritually speaking, not physically, but spiritually. It's exhausting spiritually for me to write or preach on hell. But writing and preaching, I must. Not just out of obedience to the Word of God, but just out of sheer compassion, just out of sheer love for the lost, just out of sheer concern for fellow human beings. <laughs> but I've done enough. I want to spend the next few moments as I bring this whole series of ten messages to an end. Instead of ending with the destination of the non-believers, I want to end, remind the believers of their destination. I told you before, a few minutes ago, that I would rather talk about heaven, for it is the home and the destination of every single lover of Jesus. Those who have committed their life 
to him, those in whom the Holy Spirit dwells and guides day in and day out. So let me speak in concluding to the believers. If you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, if you are walking by faith day in and day out, moment in and moment out with Jesus Christ, if you have received Him as your only Savior and Lord, if you're walking daily with Him in joy and gratitude for your salvation that He has given you, you are going to heaven. I'm our word with the Word of God. You are going to heaven. Listen to me. You may be weary of fighting the good fight of faith. You might be exhausted for standing your spiritual ground. You may be worn out refusing and refusing to compromise when everybody around you is compromising. You may be tired of standing up against the godless culture. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. Don't give up. Don't let up. Look up. Hallelujah. Look up. Amen. Look up, for I believe with all my heart the day of your redemption is drawing nigh. Your heavenly home is within sight. You can hear the footsteps of the returning Jesus. In Jesus' own words, in John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms in it. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And when I prepare the place, I'll come and take you to myself. And don't ever forget the word in Greek, place, topos, means a physical location. It is not a state of mind. It is not a metaphor. He is preparing a real place where we will reign and rule with Christ forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Words of truth from Dr. Michael Yusuf regarding the reality of hell. You're listening to Leading the Way. Maybe what you've heard has brought faith questions to mind. Well, we'd invite you to speak with a Leading the Way pastor or counsellor. Connect at ltw.org slash Jesus. Fill out a short contact form to begin your conversation. ltw.org slash Jesus. Thanks for listening today. Do join with listeners around the world next time. This program is brought to you by Leading the Way with Dr. Michael Youssef. Connect further with audio and video content at ltw.org. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.